It's all about longing for homecoming, longing to get back to the origin of life. And as we will see, the origin of life is quite paradoxically death. So it's this obsession with death, with coming back to where he came from, to nothing basically, that stands at the core of romanticism. Okay, welcome everyone to this new video. Today I want to talk about a very, very peculiar German obsession. It's an obsession of German romanticism. It's the longing for death. In German it's called the Todessehnsucht. And it's a concept that's very unique to romanticism, or basically it's always been there, but they kind of like put it into art and formulated it for the whole world to see. When did it start? I want to talk about a writer who called himself Novaz de Sudanim. He was one of the earliest German romanticists, and he came out of this uh, whole Sturm und Drang tradition. You know, this thing, we cannot let ourselves be controlled by the Enlightenment. We have to follow our heart, our feelings. Emotions might be more reliable than just our very, very hygienic clear wit. It was a counter movement that basically attacked well, the parents generation and uh, this very, 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 let's say, clean academic philosophy of the Enlightenment because they thought, these young romanticists thought, that the Enlightenment was just a theory, a philosophy for academics. It was made up by academics and had no use for the common population. So that was the thing. The Romanticists wanted to dig deeper in, let's say, the more metaphysical aspect of human life and especially into what is happening after we die, what is our goal in life, and what is our home. And this is going to be very interesting. So my plan is to come up with a few videos about German Romanticism. The first one has to be about Novalis because he formulated the main concept, the key concept of the Enlightenment very clearly in a poem that he wrote before his death. Let's take a look at it. First of all, who was this guy? So that's the grave of Novalis. Novalis was not his real name. I'll get into this a bit later. And um, he died very young. He was only 29 years old. So his real name was not Novalis. His name was Georg Philipp Friedrich von Hardenberg. And you see this von Hardenberg, so he was a nobleman. And he was born in 1772, and he died in 1801. 29 years old only. Now, he used the pseudonym Novalis as his pen name. And what does this mean, actually? Well, I mean, it goes back to his family. They were monarchs, basically, noblemen. And um, so they were de Novali, Latin. And um, so he used this de novali to call himself novalis. What does it mean? In German, it means der Neuland bestellende. And in English, it means the one who cultivates new land. So he's basically discoverer of new territories. And this is very important. He thought of himself as someone who can explore new territory. He can explore our psyche, the human psyche, his psyche, and he can also explore the realm of death, which is very important. So in this case, he saw himself as a kind of pioneer in art, in literature. And I want to show you a poem today, which is called Sehnsucht nach dem Tode, which means longing for death. Now, this poem has a very interesting history. Why is he longing for death? And why is the whole German Romanticist tradition longing for death? Well, in Novalis' case, this is very obvious because he wrote this poem after his fiancée had died. His fiancée was also an interesting character. Her name was Christiane Wilhelmine Sophie von Kühn, and she was only 15 years old when she died. And she's the main character in Novalis' Hymns to the Night, which was written in 
1800. And so Sophie, Novartis' fiancé, uh, she was very sick and he contracted a condition, a kind of like a, a liver inflammation and then tuberculosis. And in 1797, she died of it. Interestingly, Novalis himself, he also contracted tuberculosis, which was a very, very severe disease at that time because there were no antibiotics. Um, in my Kafka video, I also pointed out that Kafka died of tuberculosis. So um, his fiance died of it and he died of it four years later. And he had this obsession of following her into death. And of course, his goal was to be reunited with her. And he put this into this very, very famous, or maybe I could say infamous poem, Sehnsucht nach dem Tode, Longing for Death. So this is it. Now I'm going to give you the German poem first, just to give you an idea of uh, the whole rhythm of it, and basically the beauty of it too. And then I'm going to give you the English translation, which is very, very well done. So, let's just dive into it. Hinunter in die Erde Schoß, Weg aus des Lichtes Reichen, Der Schmerzen, Wut und wilder Stoß, Ist vor Abfahrtzeichen. Wir kommen in dem engen Kahn, Geschwind am Himmelsufer an. Gelobt sei uns die ewige Nacht, Gelobt der ewige Schlummer, Wohl hat der Tag uns warm gemacht, Und welk der lange Kummer. Die Lust der Fremde ging uns aus, Zum Vater, wollen wir nach Haus. Was sollen wir auf dieser Welt mit unserer Lieb und Treue? Das Alte wird hinangestellt, was soll uns dann das Neue? Oh, einsam steht und tief betrübt, wer heiß und fromm die Vorzeit liebt. Die Vorzeit, wo die Sinne Licht in hohen Flammen brannten, des Vaters Hand und Angesicht die Menschen noch erkannten. Und hohen Sinns einfältiglich noch mancher seinem Urbild glich. Die Vorzeit, wo noch Blütenreich uralte Stämme prangten und Kinder für das Himmelreich nach Qual und Tod verlangten. Und wenn auch Lust und Leben sprach, doch manches Herz für Liebe brach. Die Vorzeit, wo in Jugendglut Gott selbst sich kundgegeben und frühem Tod in Liebesmut geweiht sein süßes Leben und Angst und Schmerz nicht von sich trieb, damit er uns nur teuer blieb. Mit banger Sehnsucht sehen wir sie in dunkle Nacht gehüllet, in dieser Zeitlichkeit wird nie der heiße Durst gestillet. Wir müssen nach der Heimat gehen, um diese heilige Zeit zu sehen. Was hält noch unsere Rückkehr auf, die Liebsten ruhen schon lange, Ihr Grab schließt unseren Lebenslauf, nun wird uns weh und bange. Zu suchen haben wir nichts mehr, das Herz ist satt, die Welt ist leer. Unendlich und geheimnisvoll durchströmt uns süßer Schauer, mir deucht aus tiefem fernen Scholl ein Echo unserer Trauer. Die Lieben sehen sich wohl auch und sandten uns der Sehnsucht Hauch. Hinunter zu der süßen Braut, zu Jesus, dem Geliebten, getrost die Abenddämmerung geraut, den Liebenden betrübten. Ein Traum bricht unsere Banden los und senkt uns in des Vaters Schoß. So what you'll hear in the English translation is that it's all about coming home. This motif of homecoming is the core concept of romanticism. It's all about longing for homecoming, longing to get back to the origin of life. And as we will see, the origin of life is quite paradoxically death. So it's this obsession with death, with coming back to where you came from, to nothing basically, that stands at the core of romanticism. So it's quite a peculiar and sinister ideology but it has influenced German thought and German culture like nothing else. So it's very, very important. And just to be clear, at that time, when he wrote this poem, uh, he wrote it like uh, from 1797 to 1801, over a period of four years, there was no Germany. 
Well, the Germany as we know today basically came into existence in 1871. That was the German Empire. The Holy Roman Empire of German nations did not have a German nation state. It's very, very important to understand that. So there were German speaking regions and I might make a video about how Fichte, the German philosopher, tried to come up with a united Germany based on language and ethnic commonalities. But it's also very, very closely connected to Romanticism. It's going to be very fascinating. All right, now let's go through the English translation then. Down below in the shafts of earth, far removed from the reach of light, the rage and wild push of pain are the sign of a happy flight. Laid out in our narrow punt, will soon arrive at heaven's front. So you see, he's happy about getting into heaven, getting into death. Praise be to us the eternal night, praise be our eternal sleep. The day indeed has made us warm, and our cares have made us weak, driven no more by a longing to roam, we want to go back to our father's home. It's very interesting um, how like, German thought idealizes the father. And um, in this case here, he wants to be in the eternal night. And then just probably drift off into a state of oblivion where he doesn't have to think anymore and can just be at his father's home a home which he has been looking for all of his life, but which he couldn't find. But now he can find it in death. And he's happy to find this eternal sleep, a state of unconsciousness, where all thoughts just cease to exist. What are we to do in this world by loving more by staying true? All that is old is set aside. What then of all that is new? Oh, deep be sad and alone you'll stay with your pious hot love for a bygone day. Nothing matters anymore. The one truth there is, is just the non-existence in the state of death. In a bygone day, when the senses light still burned in mounting flames, the people still did recognize their father's hand and face, and with heightened sense and without being told Many still fit the primordial mold. In a bygone day, when in blush of youth, God announced his own arrival, and to early death in courageous love, he renounced his sweet survival, and drove away not pain nor fear, so that to us he would stay dear. So this is the contradiction here, that actually... Death also means life, and life cannot be there without death. I've talked about this in my Hesse video when I mentioned Heidegger. And this whole thing is um, this uh, ancient concept, philosophic concept of uh, life just being an exercise for death. You, know, you train to die during your life, and of course if you don't face death, Every single day, you cannot have an authentic, meaningful life. That's the thing. So immortality would be the worst curse there could ever be. Let's go on. With anxious longing, we see it in night's darkness drenched. In this temporality, our thirst cannot be quenched. To our homeland we must go for this holy time to know. So the homeland we have to go to is, of course, death. It's a state of not existing. It's a state of being reunited with the Father. It's a state of being reunited with not being conscious, with not knowing anything. What delays or returns still, those we love are long addressed. The course of our life is buried there. And now we know only pain and stress. We seek no more. We have no care. Our heart is full, the world is bare. So why don't we go back? Why are we waiting so long? 
because everyone we love are dead anyway. So let's go find them. Let's join them in death so we can be reunited. And because this life, this existence is only pain and stress. And so why not just give it up? So you see, this is kind of a um, very, very dark view on the world. But remember, um, he had also contracted tuberculosis and probably he was not doing very well and probably in a lot of discomfort. So that's probably it. And he was dealing with all this pain because his fiance had died of the same disease he is suffering from now. So the only thing he can think of is just to be reunited with her as soon as possible in the other world of death, because life to him is not really worth living anymore. Infinite and mysterious, sweet showers through us course, a distant echo of her grief, it seems, rings out from an unknown source. Our loved ones also pine in death and send us their longings breath. So it's our loved ones who are also longing to be reunited with us. They're calling for us to hurry up to join them. Do you have to answer this call? Do you have to answer this call? Should you? And in Novalis's view, it seems that yes, you should. You should join them as soon as possible. It's a very, very dark ideology that he's laying out here in front of us. Downwards to the cherished bride, to Jesus, the beloved, is short of dusk's dark menacing. Are those who grieve and love, a dream has caused our bands to snap and sunk us in our father's lap. So the whole poem can be read as a fantasy, a mental exercise in contemplating a homecoming. Whereas our real home, we don't feel at home in this world. We can make ourselves comfortable here. So the only thing we can do is basically find comfort in the other world, which is the world of death, of course, because everyone is there anyway. And this is the world everyone ends up. So we see this world just as a stage, a phase, so to say, just as a prelude to death. And um, this is like the other world where we are reunited with the people who matter, the people we love, the people that love us. And this is this whole fantasy of homecoming. It's just all over German Romanticism, and not only Romanticism, it's also modern philosophy. It's Heidegger, it's also literature, it's uh, Handke. And I would like to make a video about Handke's Langsame Heimkehr, Slow Homecoming, which also kind of really delves into the concept of a slow way home and finally arriving at home when, well, you find death. Well, that's it. It is so dark, but it's kind of like a German obsession, like the thought of death. I don't know. It might be a thing that has to do with German history, which was like a series of very tragic events. But it has been just formulated in art just so elaborately so that it became, it has become part of our culture, which is really peculiar. It's not a happy culture. So, I mean, in here, in this homecoming, in his uh, Novalis' poem, we can also see like how someone is cast into life. But the thing is, you're cast into it. That doesn't mean that you basically want it. I mean, you can't do anything. You know, it's Heideggerian. That's this whole concept. And what do you do? So that means you face this life, but you always have to remember that there's death. If you don't face death, you can't find serenity in this life. And you can't really prepare yourself to find serenity in death, which is the key concept of romanticism. So, and this is a quote... Uh, it's Lutke Lutkehaus, the German philosopher, who wrote this. And um, he just saw the whole, let's say, 
tradition of the West, the philosophical tradition, as contemplating death and life as an exercise to face death. So he writes, die armländische Philosophie von Platon und Epikur über Montaigne. Und Schopenhauer bis zu Heidegger hat sie als Einigung in den Tod, als Sterben lernen verstanden. Ihr Ziel war die Überwindung der Todesfurcht, Gelassenheit, ihr Eindrucksvolles Versprechen. Ja, yeah, so, starting from Plato, uh, Epicurus and Montaigne and uh, Schopenhauer and, you know, until Heidegger, they all saw life as an exercise in preparing for death. So you have to learn how to die, basically. And um, this is like this ancient concept of you have to learn how to die before you die so that you don't die when you die. So this whole paradoxical thing. But it's very important because it just lies at the core of Western philosophy. If you don't understand that, it's very hard to understand Western philosophy. So just reaching a state of serenity in this life is the highest goal because then you can face death without fear. And of course, I mean, if we take into consideration, like in Novalis's poem, uh, that means facing death is nothing to be sad about. It's actually something very happy because you finally come home to where you belong because people just belong in death, which is very, very dark again. So it's this whole thing. I mean, it's very fascinating to see how this is formulated in art. And not only in literature, but also in music. And uh, of course, I mean, I would really like to make a video about uh, Caspar David Friedrich, uh, the German painter, whose paintings are a truly unique representation of that whole romanticist spirit. And of course, they are usually connected to death. So they are not very happy paintings, but you can get an idea of what the German romanticists wanted to express. And um, you know, later on, German romanticism just turned into like a very, very nationalistic movement. And um, just because of the defeat uh, of you know, the German-speaking regions uh, by Napoleon and the elimination of the Holy Roman Empire of Germination in 1806, But um, so it kind of like made people think we have to get back to that Holy Roman Empire. It was great. It was like a, the Middle Ages were the greatest time ever and so on. So we have to kind of reclaim it. But Novalis uh, was writing before that. So he already had the spirit of German Romanticism, but not connected to any kind of nationalism because there was no German nation at that time. So it's very important to understand that it was all about sentiment and the sentiment of not having a home on this earth and only being able to find your true home, like in death. This is like the most fundamental concept and motivation. And it also manifests itself in the later writings of romanticist poetry, literature, art in general. So sorry for getting so dark in this video. I will explain more about German Romanticism in later videos. So thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next time.